Good morning and welcome to lecture number five of Vig Propulsion Systems. I hope that this lecture will be one of the most fun lectures where we will talk about your main task for the hybrid vehicle control problem where you will work with energy management of a parallel hybrid and a series hybrid. In the lecture we will repeat the material then we'll talk a little bit about optimization and what's the difference between traditional optimization and optimal control. In hand in number two you will work with deterministic dynamic programming that is an offline control methodology. It can be used for online control also but it is mostly used to, to investigate different properties of optimal control problems. In hand in assignment number three we will work with real-time control where you will implement a controller that's controlling the vehicle and that can be implemented in real time. The main difference between these systems is that dynamic programming that we'll use here has full knowledge about the complete future while the real-time control is only sitting here and now and has to act immediately. We will also look at some extra animations that I have done to teach dynamic programming for you and also illustrate what your main tasks will be during the hand-in assignment. But before going into that we will start a little bit with the repetition. The repetition is done with the forgetting factor so it's getting less and less of what I said the first lecture but we still have a little bit from the first lecture discussing the cycles and the analysis of the cycles that you're currently working on implementing analysis software for. Last lecture we talked about hybrid electric vehicles and the components in it. We have the parallel hybrid vehicle that has two parallel paths, one from the fuel tank going to the engine and out to the road and the other from the battery going out to the road. Then we talked about, then we talked about the serial hybrid vehicle where we have two paths that are working in series. We have one chemical energy path that goes to the combustion engine and to the generator and then it's hooked up in series with the battery and the electric machine and the propulsion. In the hand-in tasks you will work with both the parallel and the serial hybrid. I go back to the parallel hybrid and talk shortly about the basic properties. In the parallel hybrid the engine is connected to the wheels so we cannot select the engine speed independently of what the vehicle is doing. So the engine is connected to the wheels. While in the serial hybrid the engine is decoupled from the wheels so we can place the engine operation at an arbitrary point that's preferably good. There are many things that I want you to be aware of. We are working with power transfer and losses that occur in a vehicle because we're interested in fuel economy and fuel consumption and that's energy conversion zone. Therefore the power transfer and power losses become important. And to describe the losses and to describe the performance we're using maps. Maps are often used to describe the performance. So for example, we have a map for the combustion engine and we have a map for the electric motor. These can also be uh, transferred and we can use parameterized and scalable models. For example, the Willens approach to describe them. In the hand in assignment, we will use mostly Willens lines for combustion engines and then for the electric machines, we will work with more or less constant efficiencies but I want you to be aware of that you could replace those constant efficiency with sub-models that describe variations in the efficiency with operating condition of the device like we see here. We also talked about batteries and the standard model that we'll use have this behavior where we have an open circuit voltage USOC here and we have a state of charge of this battery and the open circuit voltage depends on the state of charge and the terminal voltage that we're seeing will depend on both the state of charge and also it will depend on what we're doing with the current. When discussing batteries and discussing battery performance a concept of C-rate is often used. C-rate is the current related to a nominal current. For a C-rate of 1 we reach full capacity in one hour. So we can relate the C-rate to how fast we're charging or how fast we're discharging. Related to this, when we do the control designs, we need to protect the battery and then we need to impose limits on the current. 
because high currents can destroy the battery. We also want to avoid emptying the battery completely and also avoid overfilling of the battery. A final thing that's very important but that we will not work with here is that the temperature of the battery is influencing how high currents we can extract or charge. For example, a battery that has minus degrees, for example minus 20 Celsius, should not be allowed to charge because that can destroy and age the battery significantly. Batteries are most comfortable in the same temperatures as humans are comfortable, around 20 degrees. The battery management system impose limits on the current that are temperature dependent, both charging and discharging. Just a short note about the new lecture that we will have ready for you after Easter, so stay tuned. An example of a battery SOC and voltage curve is shown in the plot here. You see the typical characteristics and combining the lines here by looking at the voltages and knowledge about the currents here you can extract the inner resistance and you can also extract the capacity of the batteries. There are two important battery estimation problems. We have the state of charge and we have the state of health that we use to monitor the battery. The state of charge is related to where we're running the vehicle right now and informing the driver whether or not we need to charge or if we are fully charged or not. State of health is a little bit more subtle. It relates to how the battery is worn and whether or not we will need to service and exchange the battery sometime soon. To prolong the life of batteries we can utilize control and use a control system so that it treats the battery carefully. For example, monitoring the temperature and limiting the currents. If you're interested in such things, the teacher Iman Shafikhan is working on utilizing optimal control to reduce the wear of batteries and extend the life of batteries together with Volvo construction equipment. You have also encountered QSS in the course, which is quasi-static simulation, where you're going from the cycle to the vehicle, through the gearbox to the engine, and finally you extract the fuel consumption. This is a very efficient computational process that can help you investigate different vehicle options very efficiently. So you can check many different designs in a short time period. So that was the repetition. Now we jump to the new material, which will also be a little bit of repetition in terms of your previous education. So we'll look at traditional optimization, then we'll come to optimal control, which is presumably new for all of you. And finally, we'll go to the tool that we will use in this course, deterministic dynamic programming. And this is, as I've said, the crown jewel of this course. Then we'll talk more about the details of hand in task number two. So jumping into optimization, you have had course on optimization and the basic problem that most people are starting with is linear programming. And linear programming comes from that you have a problem that is linear. So you have a linear cost function that you minimize and then you have the constraints. This is the canonical form where you have equality constraints and uh, all variables must be non-negative. All other variants with inequality constraints and free variables can be transferred to this form by introducing slack variables and introducing uh, separate variables for the negative parts, for those that can be negative. This is a convex problem. It is much analyzed. We know when there exists a solution. We know when the solution is unique. And we can also do sensitivity analysis to see how the solution changes with different uh, parameter changes. Uh, there are many algorithms. Simplex is the most famous algorithm. A short excursion about the word programming. The word programming comes from the history when the solution, the X here, was uh, a program. The X is here told the user how to do certain things, for example, how to fill a ship with material. So the program was a solution where a user could find out how this should be executed. A slightly more difficult family of optimization problem is nonlinear program where we have a nonlinear function, nonlinear constraint. There is a family of 
convex problems. These are much analyzed. We know about existence, uniqueness and sensitivity and there are many very fast algorithms. If the problem is convex then usually you can find the solution efficiently. For non-convex problems only some special problems have solutions and a local optimum is not necessarily a global optimum to that uh, problem. As engineers you need a methodology to ensure that you get a solution if you're working with non-convex problems. If we go to the industry relevance, the industry is not always interested in the optimal solution. They are more interested in getting a good solution that's enough for the product development. An even more complex problem is the mixed integer and combinatorial optimization problem. Where we have the goal function, we have the constraints and where a set of variables belongs to, for example, the integer part so we can select among one or another solution we cannot choose a continuum between these solutions this is generally a very hard problem to solve it has also been much analyzed with respect to existence uniqueness and sensitivity and there are many types of problems for example network problems are of this type when we're selecting which path should we take going from a to b and there are many algorithms available for solving these kind of problems. An example problem that we have discussed, we have looked at what gear ages give the lowest fuel consumption over a given driving cycle. And the problem is presented in Appendix 8.1 in the books, and I have talked about that previously. The problem characteristics is that we have a countable number of free variables. That's the same thing for all the problem types we have discussed previously today. We always have countable number of free variables. They can be few like this we can have five decision variables but you can also have very many like thousands or millions of decision variables and still solve the problem but still they are countable this will differ a little bit when we come to optimal control so i point this out and spend a little bit of time here to prepare you for the change to optimal control we have a computable cost so for example, we can compute the fuel consumption, that's the cost for the problem. We also have a computable set of constraints. For example, the simulation model of the vehicle is a constraint. We need to be able to follow the cycle and what the constraint is doing. We formulate the problem so that we have our countable free variables. We have our cost function and then we have the constraint. The model and the cycle should be fulfilled. When the problem is formulated, we select and apply a solver to get the solution to it. Some few comments on practical optimization. The general process for finding a solution is to try to find the right problem formulation. That includes modeling the system so that it captures the things that you are interested in. You look up what are the important properties and your goal. And then you also add constraints, for example, if you want to avoid things happening. For example, you want to avoid having high currents to the battery to prolong the life, for example. When you have found a problem, you find a solver and you try to use the tailored solver for your problem if you want to solve the problem efficiently. Thereafter, you analyze the solution and perhaps reconsider the problem and iterate. It might be the case that the solution you have have some artifacts that you are not satisfied with. Then you go back and you reformulate the problem. You maybe add more constraints and you iterate until you are satisfied. Some fundamental issues uh, that uh, I want you to be aware of. All optimal solutions are extreme points. Extreme in this sense can be that they are exhibiting uh, the best possible behavior uh, that uh, sits perhaps at corners of the allowable space. And another thing that's very important to also be aware of is that the optimizer, the solver, will always shamelessly exploit all weaknesses that you have in your model and your problem formulation. If you have left an open space for the optimizer where it can improve the performance, then it will inevitably go there. That's why you often need to reconsider the problem formulation. So you iterate over this cycle to find a good solution to your problem. With that, I think it's a good opportunity now to take a first break. So you come back and Get ready for looking at optimal control and later deterministic dynamic programming. So, see you in a while.